such as C, C++, Java. So uh, hoping that you're all com coming armed with that. Um, so I'm going to proceed with the, that assumption. Um, so uh, a little bit about the course materials. First of all, people remote. Um, if there, for any reason uh, you're not seeing something that I'm doing here, please uh, let me or uh, Bill, who's in the other room, uh, he's here to help us out. You can either send us a chat message, and uh, and Bill will alert me to that chat message if I don't notice it myself. Or you can just go ahead and you know raise your voice and, and you know let me know what's going on, and I'll try to help you out. Um, I have. Uh, laptop set up here where I'm displaying some of the material and I've got the desktop so they might not be in sync. So just keep me posted if there's anything going wrong or something you don't understand. Um, I don't use PowerPoint slides for this. I use something that's called a tiddlywiki. Um, this is something that you could completely modify while we're taking the course if you wanted. Uh, you're welcome to make notes right in it. Um, if you uh, haven't opened it up already, there should be an HTML file. Um, and if, Bill, if there's any trouble, anybody opening up the, the Tiddly Wiki, let me know. Um, so uh, does everybody here have this open? Okay. And does everybody have bomb.exe? Uh, if you have any trouble, let me know. Um, but I'll assume you've got it open now. Uh, so on the Tiddly Wiki, you can just click Edit or double click any one of these items, and it will bring up what looks like some Wiki language. Um, if you if you do this on accident, you can just hit Done or Cancel. Uh, done will save changes. Cancel will erase them. Um, there are some points through the code where I've actually masked, masked stuff away because I actually, uh, when Zeno and I designed these materials, we said we want this to be something that you can do on your own if for some reason you know you don't have access to the classroom or whatever. Um, so I have actual walkthroughs for each of the, each of the labs we're going to go through. This is a very lab intensive course. And um, Actually, sometimes we're going to start out with the lab and then try to understand what we were seeing afterwards. So I might not talk to the material until after the lab, see as we go along. Um, but this, this information is going to be commented out. You'll see if you open this up, in some situations we've got this, these uh, comment marks. If you delete those, it will expose that content to the wiki once you save it. Um, so I don't think we'll be having to worry about that since you're all here with me. But if you have any questions about that, let me know. Um, so uh, where to begin? So reverse engineering. How many of you actually do reverse engineering on a daily basis? All right, so some of you do this already. Um, so some of this material might be you know, old hat to you. Um, but um, how about uh, Charles? What is, oh, Matt, I'm sorry. No problem. No, I, I'm one of the weird people that go by my building. No problem, no problem. Uh, what's one thing that you do reverse engineering? Um, What's your goal? I do a lot of work with the, trying to understand the Windows kernel. So okay. I do a lot of window bugs. Okay, so what what is the, the end end goal of of your reverse engineering? Um, try to figure out good state for Windows kernel. Well, basically, the project is the, the try to secure the Windows kernel. Better. Okay, so we're we're securing things. Okay, so maybe we're trying to do some debugging, or we're trying to find some weaknesses in code or uh, malware analysis. We're trying to understand something so that we can get it out of our system or figure out how to interact with it. Um, of 
course, there are other nefarious purposes. I am no legal expert. I'm not going to tell you what you can use reverse engineering for. Uh, you are more than welcome to hack at the bomb.exe, which we're going to, which we're going to be coming across pretty soon here. Um, but when you get started with reverse engineering, you got an application, you want to understand something about it. First, you want to ask yourself, what is it I'm looking for? And it's very easy, easy to get lost in, in the weeds. Uh, there's so much to look at, so many different functions. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that might just throw you off the trail. Always remember what it is that you're looking for. So are we, are we trying to understand you know, how this thing communicates? Do we know something about uh, where our program crashed? If you know some output string that appears on the screen when, you're, when your program crashes, Maybe you want to start looking for that. Start with that. Have some sort of focus. Um, and uh, so what are the outputs? What are the inputs? And what behavior do we already know about this thing? So uh, you might have already done some. You might have executed the thing to try to understand what does it do. Um, and a little bit deeper dive. So. What, what are we looking for? We're looking for maybe some strings of interest. We're looking for particular functions. Uh, maybe you know that it talks, talks on the network, so we're looking for, for some sort of Windows API call that says uh, uh, send or receive. Uh, and maybe we're looking for some sort of iterative behavior. Maybe we're, we know that it does something over and over again, so we're looking for some sort of loops or uh, conditional statements. So, our tool of the trade is Ida Pro today. Um, there, there might be other tools out there that you use. Uh, we are going to focus on Ida. This course is about static analysis. Okay. Uh, we might do some a little bit of debugging uh, over the, uh, the course of day two, but today is going to be all static analysis. Uh, you, you may find that in some of the exercises, you, uh, the work that you're doing is aided by actually running the thing while trying to look at the code. Um, I won't stop you from doing that. Whatever gets, gets you to uh, the result we're looking for, that's, that's cool. Um, but let's go ahead and actually open up IDA. So. Everybody find IDA in order to or to get it. Okay. Now typically when I use IDA, I just, I have IDA on my desktop, I drag the executable on top of it, or I do something like this. Open up IDA and click Go. And we just have blank canvas and we need to actually load up our file. So, we're missing something. Yep. Okay. So, we're going to go ahead and uh, drag bomb.exe into IDA. Let go. It's going to bring up this load a new file dialog. And I'll give uh, these guys a second. See if they can straighten out there. Oh. Are there any other programs that are necessary too that we went up forgetting? Uh, no, this this should be okay. Much it. I mean, I, I asked to have Python installed, so um, some of these problems you'll be able to solve through writing little scripts. Um, I encourage you, by all means, if if that helps you, go ahead and do it. Um, I personally use Python for the, these purposes because it is kind of de the de facto language that's used in a lot of the tools. Um, Ida actually has a, a Python uh, Python SDK, and as well as one that's uh, written in C, um, and there there are various other tools that that you might like, want to use Python for. So. Um, Mike, do you think we're going to, this is probably going to be a while. 
No, it's all done. It was just the system restore that was mm -hmm. It did Windows updates over the weekend. Oh. So but I just, I just, yeah. yeah. So. Okay. So once we got IDA open, uh, load a new file. Okay. So I uh, just drag uh, bomb.exe onto the, the IDA desktop there. Yeah. All right. And we're going to click OK. Um, but before we do that, I'm just going to talk about this a little bit. So typically, don't do a whole lot with this guy. Uh, this, this allows you to tell IDA where some of the information in the executable is. Um, this is something that you're typically going to do when somebody's trying to divert you uh, or trying trying to make it difficult for you to understand where everything is. Or let's say you have a malicious doc file and you know it has shell script in it. Uh, you want to open it up in IDA. IDA doesn't understand doc. It's not going to point you in the right direction where the shell code is, obviously. So uh, you might do something in here to tell Ida where to find the code. But we won't worry about this at all today. Um, we uh, Later on, we'll look at this load resources option. Uh, but now let's just click OK. And you're asked, do you want to load symbols? Um, so when you compile an application, you can choose whether or not to, to output symbols. Symbols are basically pointers to where uh, functions or variables are located in an executable. All right. So as I was saying, symbols uh, not always provided with an application. In fact, uh, if you have a malicious binary and you have the symbols for it, um, that's a really lame attacker. He's, uh, he's uh, probably got much bigger problems than, than uh, just sharing the symbols with you. So uh, we're going to go ahead and say yes. We would like that symbol information available to us. And um, <coughs> oh, got this ugly version of IDA. So newer versions of IDA uh, provide you a uh, much more uh, clean interface. Everything's tiled. Um, we get to deal with the free version today. Uh, but uh, you're going to see something a little bit different if you if you decide to go ahead and use the full-blown IDA. Um, but a lot of these features are, are kind of the newer versions are backward compatible with what we're doing today. So a lot of this should, uh, if you go ahead and use a registered version of IDA, should be seeing what we're seeing here. So whenever you open up a new binary, it's an executable file that, that IDA understands, such as a Windows PE like this is. Um, you're going to get this information. It's just a bunch of metadata about the file. Um, so we've got the MD5 of the file, so <coughs> the signature of it, um, file name format. So this is a portable executable. Um, it's a format that, that's used to execute programs in Windows. Uh, the image base right here is the address in virtual memory of where this, where this application was loaded. So the, the file that you clicked on, when you double click in the EXE and it launches, the image base is where in memory that file begins from the, the, the first byte of that file. And located at that first byte should be MZ. Um, and that's an indicator that we've got an, an executable. Um, and we've got a bunch of other information. We don't need to go into detail. Um, if you scroll down, you'll see a main function. And so we've got right here. This is our, our stack. Um, on the stack, you, you've got variables that you're using throughout the course of the application. You've got functions calling functions. One function wants to pass information to the function it's calling. That information is right here. So these guys right here are arguments that were passed when this function was called. 
and this is some sort of local variable. So when when you when you got your code, you declare you know an integer with the, the name var underscore four. That's what this would be. Um, now on the right hand side here, you see these are offsets from from the base of the stack. So uh, do I have any whiteboard that I can look at here? I guess over here. If you use a black pen, uh, uh, if so, if your function is called absolutely. <laughs> oh, it might be worse. Well, I'm trying to draw. Thank you. So when a function is called, just before the call, <laughs> sorry remote users if you can't see this, but the markers are insufficient. So okay. So let's say we're calling some function. Green is terrible. So if we're calling a function um, in let's call it so in C we're gonna have something like who part one, part two. Okay. When we call this function going to happen is the calling function is going to have its stack here. We're going to have return address. And then we're going to have local variables. But before this happens, the calling function is responsible for putting arguments onto the stack. So this is what we're seeing here. So I like to draw my stacks one way. Zeno likes to draw his stacks the other way. He always harasses me about this. But this is the way I see it in Ida. So that, this is the way I, I draw them. Local variables are up here, so this would be your, your minus four, this would be r underscore four. So you have the bottom of memory at the top. Right. Yes, I do everything backwards. And this would be zero. And so negative four is location here. Four. So, one thing I want to note is that this says var4, and oftentimes people start to think, well, that must be four bytes off from, from some particular location. Just to be clear, you might see an IDA somewhere that says var4, but it's actually an offset of C. Uh, I suggest that you don't think about it this as as a number, but just some arbitrary uh, arbitrary name for the variable. Um, always take a look at the at the stack parameters here to get an idea of whether or not the, the variables offset that number. But we'll come to that later. Um, so. So in Ida, we're provided these graphs. As you saw, there was just a single block. Okay, that's a, a very simple function. Uh, not a whole lot happening there. Um, and this was a feature that was added in in, in Ida five. Um, it's something that 
for years people were using Ollie Debug, Win, WinBag, uh, Win, uh, WinDebug, uh, GCC, uh, GDB, sorry. I don't know why it says GCC. Um, and uh, in IDA, they added, uh, in, in version 4.17, they added a, a, a graph tool. And it was all right. It, it allows you to just look at a call, gra uh, a call graph, and it also allows you to look at the graph of a function. So you've got things connected by branches. You've got things connected by loops. Uh, and we'll demonstrate this soon. But um, you can use IDA in this graph view which you can see here, we've got a bunch of nodes connected together. Um, these branches here, uh, the, the red and the green, that's the traditional. Uh, green is going to indicate that uh, a, jump, uh, a jump has been taken, and a red branch says that the jump wasn't taken. Um, that's based on some sort of conditional. So if we zoom in here, we see, what's that keyword term that you just use? Uh, good, good question. Um, so in order to zoom in IDA, if you hold the control key and uh, use your, your mouse wheel, you can zoom in and out. So uh, if everybody wants to go ahead and just try that. Um, that I think applies also everywhere too. So right. So that's uh, that's one of those universal ones. Right. So surprisingly, a lot of people, you know, it's new to them. So so uh, don't don't be afraid to ask a question. If, if there's something that I do and you're wondering how did I do that, uh, please let me know. Um, if for some reason you end up off of the graph, we have this graph view, and if you click on it, it'll take you to wherever you click on the graph. Um, so. If you get, if you lose the graph for some reason, you are just seeing a blank space. Just go ahead and use this graph overview. And if that's missing, then raise your hand or uh, send a chat to Bill, and we'll get you straightened out. Um, okay. So one of the other features Ida has is it's got this context highlighting. And for those of you following along in the wiki, um, we're on this page here. So context highlight, highlighting allows us to understand the flow of any particular variable or any particular register throughout, throughout the, the function. So let's say we click on argc. We want to see where this is used. We can see. Right at the beginning of our function here, we've got a comparison. So if it's one, it's going to take uh, take the, um, this jump on the right. And if it's not, then it's going to go to the left. So compare when, when you have compare instruction. It's going to say uh, set the uh, zero flag to, uh, to one if this comparison matches. And so we see right here, it's doing a JNZ. If it's zero, we're going to jump to the right. Uh, and we can see, um, actually, <laughs> said that backward. It's so we're, if if the com comparison succeeds, we're going to we're going to go to the right here and continue on checking our our RC. If not, uh, it's going to jump down to this block here. So. Once again, uh, we see RC is used here. <coughs> so this context highlighting allows us to understand where, where is this variable used? Is it important to the function? So you might want to just click on a variable and zoom out far and see if, where is this thing used. Okay. You can do this with function names. So click on one of these functions. And what do we see here? We see this function is called repeatedly throughout the course of our application. Same thing with printf. So take advantage of that feature to, uh, to trace any particular information that you're trying to understand. Uh, if you're trying to uh, see how, how uh, variables move through the registers, 
you can go ahead and do that with registers as well. So, um, and push and pop in instructions. So you want to see how the stack grows or shrinks. We see all these calls to push. Um, that might help us to understand, you know, where where are we at in the stack? Um, you might have a, a successive bunch of push calls, and then you'll have a, a call instruction. Okay, that might tell us how many variables are being given to that function. So, for example, right here, we've got a push and then a call. So, in this case, we might assume that this only takes one one argument. Okay. Are, we also, all, are all parameters passed in the stack? No. Parameters can be passed through uh, through registers. Um, and that's something that we'll come to tomorrow. Um, pretty much everything we're going to deal with today is parameters passed through the stack. Um, and we'll talk about different calling conventions. So um, when, when a function is called, the, the, uh, the designers of, of the compiler can decide, or the, the, the person who's writing the code can decide how parameters are passed to a function. And um, so, as he's pointing out, not always going to be on the stack, but today it will be. Okay. So we also have this ability to color instructions. So coloring. Uh, will give us some sort of indication of, uh, uh, say, say we're trying to, to trace uh, some particular function and it gets very convoluted. You can organize your code uh, by, by coloring. Um, so you can color a block. So let's have everybody try this out. We're going to take this block over here. And you'll see in the upper right hand corner of this block, we've got a little color grid. So if you click on that color grid, you'll get a, a color chooser. And you can say we'll choose green. Now, now maybe we can use this to say we've, we've analyzed this block and we, we understand it already. or Maybe you could write some sort of a IDA script that goes through and when you execute a debugger, it colors every block that it visits. Um, that's something that uh, we can discuss outside of class. Uh, we won't get into a whole lot of scripting, but um, if you have any questions about that, let me know. So anybody having any trouble with that? With coloring, any questions? Matthew, any uh, questions if, for the remote users? If Ida gets confused yeah. about control flow because of obfuscation or whatever, can you have it re-graph once you um, point out the error of its ways? Uh, can you have it re-graph? Okay. Question was, if Ida gets confused about the flow of the application due to some sort of uh, of obfuscation, can you have Ida regraph it? Well, uh, I'm assuming that you're asking if you make some sort of changes. Yeah, or could the flow be can you re -graph it? Or something external to the program that's only determined at runtime, so it makes a bad guess? Okay, so um, that that's something uh, basically, so Ida might might uh, decide that code is in one particular place and isn't really. Um, this is a topic that maybe we can discuss tomorrow. Uh, we'll come to. But um, uh, if, let's say you, uh, you have some block that for some reason gets undefined. Um, so 
don't need to follow along with me, but um, if you have something <coughs> like this, um, the code, there's for some reason, this block here just goes into nothing. There's no nothing that follows it, and it's kind of an odd end to a function because usually you're going to have either a jump, a return, uh, a call to some exit function, something that indicates that we've come to the end of the end of this function. Um, what happens is if we define code here, Ida redraws the graph for you. So so. When you, when you change how code is defined, then yes, uh, the, the IDA will actually autocorrect itself for you. It does. Okay. Thank you. So does that answer your question? Okay. Now, uh, another thing I want you to try is just go ahead and click on one of these boxes and just drag it somewhere. Okay, we can, we can move these things around and arrange them as uh, as we see fit. Um, if for some reason you do this on accident or you don't like the changes you've made, um, you can revert them. So if you right click on any of this negative space, anywhere where there isn't a block, you can click layout graph and it will redraw it for you. So it will rearrange everything. Okay? So, um, So I uses all sorts of different colors to indicate um, what a particular instruction is, uh, what it means, uh, or uh, it, it, there are different colors used within the debugger. Um, so we've got blue, which indicates the current structure pointer, red which indicates an enabled breakpoint, green disabled breakpoint, uh, and purple indicates when we're debugging, uh, this is a line where uh, your current, so the instruction pointer is pointing at this line, and you have a breakpoint there. So let's say you, you run the program, and you have it run until it hits a breakpoint. You'll see a, a purple line. So that indicates that's where you are, and that is your breakpoint. Um, and then yellow is uh, yellow is highlighting, as I showed you, the context highlighting before. So the reason I point out these colors right now is that if you use choose these colors in our color grid here, say we choose this yellow, you now can't use that feature. You can't you can't actually see the context highlighting. Uh, so uh, I suggest avoiding these particular colors. Um, there are different blues, greens, reds, purples uh, that you can use uh, that won't conflict. Um, so if, if you've already set yellow when we were experimenting with the chooser here, um, I'd suggest clicking on there and going ahead and choosing white as the color. Okay. Um, I was mentioning before different colors for branches. So we've got Green is, uh, says a condition was met. We've got red that says the condition failed. Uh, and then we've got loops um, and, and regular flows. So a regular flow is just two instructions that um, are, are separated by some sort of block delineation. Um, so right here you can see We've got this location 401065. It's got a regular flow. <laughs> so because this block has a jump to it, there, th this is isolated as a single block. And then you can see there's another instruction that goes into here. Um, so that's just a regular flow. Um, whereas Got the conditional drill, uh, conditional branch. Okay, and in this we don't have any loops, but.
but I'll show you right here. Uh, not this option. Okay. So it's kind of hard to tell, but loops are indicated by a slightly thicker blue line. So we've got our regular flow and then we've got our loop branch here. And if you look in your graph overview here, you'll see we've got a block that goes back into a loop, uh, block at the top. This is an indicator of a loop. I don't know that our blocks really look like yours. There's no loop in my bomb that I can see. Okay, so we'll come to that. Uh, I'm just showing this for demonstra demonstration purposes. Um, uh, how about this? Uh, one of the really handy uh, commands that you can use is uh, jump to address. And you can use that using G. So hit the G key. Everybody hit the G key. And we're going to jump to OX. Okay, OX tells us we're talking hex addresses. Okay, hexadecimal. And 401810. Again, that's 401810. So if we click OK, we'll jump to that location. And this is the function where I'm, uh, I'm looking at this loop. If you zoom out here, you'll see something similar to what we see in the graph overview. All right. So once again, for zooming, control and mouse wheel. Okay. So now, let's say you've jumped to somewhere and you want to get back to where you were before. If you hit the escape key, it'll take you backwards. So you guys should have gone back to the main function. All right. So, and that brings us to our next point. So navigation, um, I just talked about going to a particular address. Um, you can also double click it, it will, double click will allow you to trace to to uh, th where a jump is. So if for some reason a jump is off the screen, double click a jump, it'll bring it to you. So right here you can see I've got this jump instruction. Double click it and it's moved down to where that is. So sometimes these jumps might be way down the page and so you can double click and it'll bring you to it. Um, you also can click on a function. So we've got all these calls here. A lot of them are to things that are in pink. Um, and this is something I didn't mention when discussing the coloring. Uh, so these calls that are in pink, those are indicators of a dynamically linked, uh, dynam dynamically linked dynamically linked function. So uh, these are things like printf, for instance, as we have here. Um, you might have file open. You might have some sort of networking functions. These are all things where the, the developer of the application didn't want to rewrite the kernel, didn't want to rewrite uh, the features to actually uh, create files or, or all these things. So this has already been done for us, so we reuse these functions. And on top of that, dynamically linked says we're not including this, this function actually into our binary. So the code for this is located elsewhere. It helps us to save on space. And it helps us to, to do things in a uniform fashion so that the code is always the same. All right. So um, so if we double click on printf, for instance, it just takes us to this iData, iData section. 
and iData is import data. Uh, it's referenced from the, the headers, which are located at the very beginning of the executable, and we'll talk about that later. Um, and this is basically just a table of addresses where, where the function resides. So when Windows loads this application, it then says, okay, where's our, our library in memory? Okay, let's associate the functions from that, that library into our application here. We'll store this address here, <coughs> and every time we make a call, we're going to actually jump to, to this address that's in the table. Okay. So if you hit escape, that'll bring you back to the main function. And then you can double click on one of these calls to uh, sub underscore anything. So these are typically user-defined functions, uh, um, meaning the developer wrote this code um, and, and compiled it. Um, and Ida has no idea what this function was called. When you, when you compile an application, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you can use symbols. And if you load symbols for this particular bomb.exe, uh, you would actually see what, what the author originally intended these functions to be. But because they're trying to be crafty and make it so you don't understand what's going on, uh, that information isn't included. Uh, it, it also is space saving. So, so uh, that's the, the main reason why we don't pass this information along. It's really for optimization. We don't really need it. It's, it's useless once the program is already compiled, unless you're trying to understand the application. So hit escape if you already jumped to that function. Now you know how to, how to navigate to a function. And um, I guess another handy shortcut key is, say you accidentally hit the escape key, and for some reason, the address that you went to wasn't, isn't readily available to you on the screen here, you can hit control enter and that will take you forward. So that's all in the, in the wiki and the navigation under getting to know Ida. <coughs> okay, and then we have uh, a bunch of other shortcuts that will come in handy. Um, these ones we are really just for reference. Okay, we won't have to deal with defining code and, and defining um, defining strings and that sort of thing until later on in the course. But uh, if you are trying to figure out how to define any particular thing, come back to this. Uh, and so undefined bytes says, I don't really understand what this thing is. I want I to stop telling me what it thinks it is. Um, define code. So say you you come across something that looks like an instruction, you press C, you're going you're gonna to see what Ida thinks the code will look like. And P will define a function, and so on. So uh, one of the most useful ones to you is going to be A, which defines an ASCII string, and we'll come across that later on. So. Once we come ac across a function that we're actually interested in, in looking at, uh, the question is then, where do we go? So uh, actually, any questions, Bill, from, uh, from anybody out there? None that I've seen in the chat. Okay. okay, so the first thing we're going to ask is, when we come into this function, you know, what, it, what does it do? Does it, does it call a bunch of other functions, or is all the work that needs to be done, all the math, all the, all the logic, is it all contained within the blocks of code that we see? Um, so you might have no calls, and that's going to indicate that this is a leaf node. Uh, it's, it's the end of the tree. Um, it, the thing doesn't, the, the, the thing is the final place where, where all the, all the, the logic is, is done. It might be a function to add two numbers, might be a function to calculate pi, 
whatever the case may be. Um, or it might not have any calls because it uses some other mechanism to get to another function. And we'll come across that later on. Uh, one example would be interrupts. So uh, interrupts are commonly used uh, on Unix platforms to go to go to whatever system call that you're interested in doing. So say you want to write a file, you might see an interrupt instead of a call. So regular function is a non-library function. That's the, the kind of function I was talking about before. This is uh, probably uh, compiled by the, the user, or it might be some sort of statically linked library that Ida has never seen before. Uh, so Ida uses what's called flirt signatures. So if a function is uh, compiled statically, inserted into, into the application statically, as opposed to having it in some other file, um, Ida will, will show you this function and use, use a flirt signature. It just checks a sequence of bytes. And the, the whole purpose is to uh, identify functions that we've already analyzed. So um, we won't get to how to how to create flirt construction uh, flirt signatures, but we can do that offline uh, if you want. Um, but Ida provides you a lot of these for standard operating system functions. Uh, we've got so we've got library functions and. These are the sorts of things like I was showing you. There's the calls to print up. Um, the, they're the items that, that are statically linked. Um, they'll be they'll, they'll have a blue name, but they'll be something recognizable like print up. And then there are the dynamically linked ones, which will, will be labeled pink. So uh, light blue for for the statically linked pink means they're they're imported dynamically. So the code for dynamic functions, once again, not in, in the binary itself. Um, so when you come across these library functions, uh, there's information out there for, for us. So we don't have to analyze the thing. We don't have to do any work beyond going to, say, MSDN. So MSDN is one of, one of the best resources when you're, when you're uh, analyzing a, a binary. Have that handy. Um, C++.com might tell you things about functions like uh, fopen, printf, these sorts of things that are standard to, to uh, non-Microsoft applications. And then we've got indirect calls. So you might see some sort of a call, call brackets EAX. So this says, whatever address is in EAX, go to that location. Get, get the value there, get a, get a 4 byte value, or 8 byte if we're in 64 bit, and go to that address. Um, these uh, tend to be very interesting when you're looking at something like a malicious code, or when, you, when you're analyzing your, uh, um, analyzing a vulnerability, or that sort of thing. Um, because these are the kinds of things that you're going to have to fill in. These are the, the gaps that you're going to have to fill in. What does this thing do? Where is it going? And sometimes it's on purpose that they're trying to mislead you or try to try to prevent you from understanding where they're going. And sometimes it's just how the code is built. So what are the outputs? So EAX is the common return register. Um, it's not always the case. But in most cases, EAX is going to contain the return value. Uh, and if there's a float, then EDX and EAX is used to return the entirety of the float. Um, so when, you, when you're looking at the end of a function, you're trying to understand what's, what is its return value, you can kind of work backwards. OK, RC is going to be what we're return, returning from this function. So how is var c used? And this is where context highlighting comes in handy. So we might work backwards to understand what this function does. We see, OK, EAX get, gets var c. Let's trace the function and figure out what that does. All right. 
Um, is there any are there any file system calls? Are there any networking operations? Uh, these are the kinds of other kind of outputs that we we tend to forget. So um, you know, the output might be the purpose of the function may be just to, to write some files. So maybe EAX is completely useless. Maybe it doesn't actually return a value. Um, and then uh, are any arguments written to? So when you have something that's passed into into the, the function, so in our main function here we've got arg c, arg b. Uh, look for anything where where these are actually being written to. Uh, maybe these these arguments are are actually passed by reference and somebody wants to change them. Okay. What are the inputs to the functions? We already talked about stack arguments, uh, and uh, as as mentioned before, there are other calling calling conventions. Uh, so sometimes registers are used to pass information in. Uh, you might also have, once again, you might have file inputs, uh, network inputs. Um, what, the, what about uh, the, the flow of this, this function? Does it have loops? Does it have conditional branches? Uh, use the IDA overview. Um, you can move around to see you know, what, what is the flow of this, this application. Uh, this this one doesn't do anything iteratively. Okay, and say you're using IO in conjunction with the debugger, then that this will help you to understand. Well, this isn't the behavior I'm looking for because I'm expecting it to do something over and over again. Now we've got these other kinds of flows. So. Uh, <clears throat> some things that you might see when somebody's trying to, to master their code, they, you might see these calls to dollar plus five. So sometimes people want to save an address in the in the instructions themselves. Okay, so what they'll do is they'll do this call dollar plus five. Um, so that's gonna just go directly to the next instruction because a call is generally five five bytes. Okay, so it's dollar is just saying the current address plus five. So what might happen next is the next instruction is a pop instruction. A pop instruction will take the value at the top of the stack and put it into some register. So when this call occurs, it's going to push the current address and then go to the next instruction. Then the pop happens and that, that address of the call of the call instruction is going to now be in some sort of variable or, or in a register. So that might be a situation where code wants to overwrite itself. Okay, So you, you have this. Uh, it's storing some location where later on it's going to overwrite it, whether it's to get the code out of your site. So when, when you're debugging, it's, it's complicated to understand the flow of things. Or uh, it might be just trying to use as little amount of memory as possible to avoid uh, stepping on something that will crash the application. Then we've got indirect jumps. These jumps where, uh, just like the, the indirect call that I was showing before, it's gonna it's gonna jump to some address stored in in a register or at a memory location. So just a, a, a refresher. When you see something in brackets, that is dereferencing a, a, a register or or a memory uh, memory location. So it's going to that register or to the, the memory address. It's getting an address out of there. It's then going to that address and getting the information added. Then we've got interrupts and interrupts. Uh, well, they interrupt the the flow of the of the application. They say Okay, operating system, there's something I want to do and only you can do it. So int 3 is a common one. That's, uh, that's actually a breakpoint instruction. So let's say that you, you're messing around with this thing and you want it to stop in a particular location. Well, IDA provides you the ability to use hardware and software breakpoints. But you could also 
modify the binary. So let's say you have you have an application and it calls to some other application. It maybe it dumps a file and then executes it. If you can intervene between the dumping of the file and the execution of it, you can insert one of these in three instructions if you know where where the where the new file is going to start executing from. And then you can get your debugger to, to break on that. So that's something that um, we'll, we'll, we can discuss later. Um, but uh, probably we won't do in this course. But. So is there any exception handling? And this is something that's kind of changing. Um, a lot of application, uh, a lot of malware did this in the past, as well as your your run of the mill applications. Um, FS0 is uh, a special location for Windows, and it's uh, it's where the address is located, where where uh, a exception handler uh, uh, structure is located. So let's say that you want when a divide by zero occurs, or or some some unhandled exception occurs, you want you want uh, you want your own code to execute. So you can replace the exception handler this way, and and this is the unhandled exception handler. It's located at FS zero, um, meaning anything that that the the developer decided that they're not going to deal with. So maybe they'll deal with divide by zero, but maybe they won't deal with uh, access of memory that um, is, is, for some security-related reason, not accessible. Um, so this is something that you may not see as much anymore, but chances are, especially if you're doing malware analysis, you're going to come across this. Um, and then obvious, obvious violations. So whether this is on purpose or not, um, you might have, let's say, you have this EVX XOR together. Anything XOR, XOR with itself is zero, and then you see a, a div. Um, either somebody really screwed up when they're writing this application, or maybe they're doing this for some particular reason. Maybe they're trying to force an exception. 